for my part, as a, as a communication manager for a big infrastructure program, uh, like the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, a full bridge program that had a few other bridges in it, visualization became a really important key uh, component of telling the communities like what we were going to be doing. One of the problems we had at the very beginning of the project is that, well, people just didn't believe we were actually going to build the bridge that we did. And so visualization and some of the ways that we distributed visualization became key components in getting that belief to change. And, and although that doesn't seem, and we go back to that return on investment here, it, it doesn't seem very tangible. It, it, it is the difference between building your project and not building your project. So that's, that's, that's my little opening. I'll turn it back over to you to, to, to take off with the entertainment side. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, start by kind of trying to identify some of the differences between the two worlds that, that we're talking about here. Um, but I want to start it with uh, a little clip that, to me, was kind of interesting when Bart first showed this to me. Um, obviously, it's the speeder sequence from uh, Empire. Or Jeff, return of Jeff, right? Come on. photography, they worked out their shots based on the shots. And so what I tried to do was, was write down a few notes on what I thought were the differences between that thought process of setting up a scene versus how we as visualization artists in the design world think. And their driving force is the camera. Set up the camera and the location. Get the set set up. And then how does the scene unfold, the action? I mean, can you imagine talking to an engineer about, you know, how is this scene going to unfold? And uh, what is the emotion you're trying to convey? Again, it seemed in our conversations that that was always the question. Well, what, what is the emotion you're trying to get out of this shot? What's the color? What's the, the mood? And then last, what are we learning about the characters? And in the real world, what, what is that? Who are the characters? That's a, a, a very interesting way to think about it. So then I thought, here's how we typically walk through a project. We get plans and drawings and sections, and we build a model. The first thing we do is we get our modelers busy out there, let's build that model. You know, only then can we look at it and try to understand what does it look like, how does it work. You know, maybe function or, or activity is part of our story. And then we start getting into these visual impacts. That's usually the driving force behind what we're doing. What is the project going to look like for people who are near it? And what is it going to look like to people who are in it? You know, what does it look like to the users? Only last and sometimes never do we get to this idea of who is the character. You know, the architecture of the scene, that's what I think of as the character. What is the, the style and the mood that the project is trying to, to uh, convey? So I want to show a classic video. This is typically what we're asked to do when we first engage with project teams, especially with, uh, with um, engineers or road designers. I want you to start at the beginning of the project, and I want you to drive to the end of the project. And so we sometimes end up with five minutes of, of this. It's informative, it's important, but you know, after a while you stop seeing it. You're noticing the cars, and wow, that's not the right yellow on the stripe there. No. Now, you're not really looking at the project anymore. You're, you're just sort of uh, nodding off because it's, a, it's such a static kind of scene. And so I guess what, what we like to try to do with all our projects is think a little bit more like a, a movie producer or a, a cinematographer, if you will. And, and I've showed some of these before, but you know, mix shortcuts of different types of shots and try to think about what is it about this project that's the most compelling or the most interesting to look at. You know, nobody's ever going to see this view unless you're uh, using a UAV of some kind now to fly through it, right? Yeah. And, and what I'd like to add to that is, is having been the person that spoke to crowds with, this, with these animations, what we were trying to convey there was a story that Oakland and San Francisco are united by this bridge. 
That's why those, those opening shots that you never see, like Kevin said, uh, were specifically called out. Because when you're looking at that tower, and especially how the, how the camera comes around, you see that although this is going to be the gateway to the East Bay, it really is a part of San Francisco. So how do, how do you start a process like this? Again, we tried to ad adopt this cinematic approach and looked at what you know, people in the industry were doing. And quite often, they would work scenes out, just like in the very first video, work it out based on shots and characters. I mean, this is a, this is a rig pulling uh, muck from the bottom of the, <laughs> the straits of, uh, this is in Turkey, uh, whatever the straits are there. But you know, what is it the story what is the story they're trying to tell? And let's block it out in images, show it to the client, and say, here's what we think the animation should be. It's not just let's build a model and start you know, rigging the characters. What is it you want to say about it? Um, sometimes it's just like the Bay Bridge. It's how do you get into a scene. So for this particular project, we're going to start with an overview. We want to show the location, the context, and the, the scale of the project. Then we're going to zoom down and show the architecture of the project. And it's going to be oblique. It's not going to be in the project. Only then do we zoom down and start looking at the action. Now we're going to see what this little video is all about. And this has been relatively successful. You know, I, we find there's a really long learning curve amongst a lot of the people that we deal with, especially owners um, versus engineers. Engineers, I think, adopt this idea of being a little bit more like a movie producer, more actively than, than some of our, our less sophisticated, you know, less technical um, clients do. Then another little piece I wanted to show, and, and this I think is probably the most important thing we've tried to adopt from the community, is the idea of what we call an animatic. All right, we've got the model kind of partially built. We kind of have an idea of some music we want to use that might be a voiceover. Is to use the model and just do really quick animations, setting up cameras, and show the client and the other users, here's what we're thinking, what do you think? You know, we want to move through it this way. We want to show where the street is. But this also provides a really important value to us because if we get sign off, we can get them to approve what we're trying to do. You know, we can then focus our modeling efforts on very specific areas of the model. We don't have to just keep modeling randomly all over the place. The camera is now driving all the work that's being done in production. Again, that's a very it's more of a film special effects kind of thought process. And in this particular case, you know, they love the shots right off the bat, so we were able to take those and pretty much stick to the script and then really concentrate on adding detail based on those camera shots. And I think I showed this okay, it's, a, it's a design for a redevelopment of a street in downtown Denver. And again, we tried to use some you know, interesting sort of concepts. Denver's a city of seasons. Everybody talks about how the seasons change on a daily basis. So throughout the animation, the seasons are changing as you inspire some conversation. We have a little bit more to talk about, but I thought at this point, any any sort of questions or thoughts on this whole idea? Are we completely foreign to most people here? Well, yeah. Makes sense. We're trying to create human emotion, right? Yeah. Where's Make people the, engage the project. Right. Where's, mm -hmm. I mean, where's us engineers? We, we, don't even know, we don't even know what emotion is. <laughs> yeah, I guess the matrix analogy, you know, you got the, the, the one matrix like the the visuals, the, the residual self-image, and the things like that, the things that you see. And then, the, I guess in the movie, you got, you know, the engineer, you know, the, the one that, that ended up betraying everybody. <laughs> the engineer at the screen going, I don't look at that. I just see, I just see code, you know. Blonde, green that redhead, he's, he's looking at pure code. So he's looking at the matrix as an engineer versus everybody else looking at the matrix as this, you know, this emotion thing. And I, I think it's important difference to make this, you know, we, when the engineers, we, we look at visualization, we're looking at, we're trying to, we're trying to see the data inside, we're looking for errors of emissions versus the entertainment and selling the project, we're trying to make people feel something. Yeah, it's interesting because the first person that I remember talked about um, 
the public feeling something about the project was somebody from Balfour Beatty, a construction firm, who we were acquired by recently, but we brought in some of our animations to a BIM expo, and they brought up a lot of, you know, 4D models and things, but then they showed one of these visualizations and said, you know, we really think we ought to be doing this more, getting people to make an emotional connection to the project. When it's, when it's so technical, it, you know, yeah. you, you back off from it and it puts up a screen between you. Now, I guess I should correct myself. We engineers do have emotions. We just forgot where we put them. <laughs> you just keep them at home, yeah. Do you get much political pushback or from trying to present something like this? Well, it depends say, on the client that you have. Some are more enlightened than others, but there usually is an education process <clears throat> that you have to kind of keep pushing until they... Yeah, I'd like to address that a little bit because it's an important part. I, I sort of see uh, my role in these things as being sort of a third track. Yes, there's entertainment and you're, you're putting butts in seats so that you can do your next job. And engineering, you're trying to get things built. But uh, project communication is, is sort of serving the ultimate goal of getting that project built. And that's where, that's where things like story and character are starting to become more important in the animations that we do. Um, we could very easily have called this presentation story and character and visualization. Um, the, and the reason for that is that people don't understand some of these big projects or the complexity of, of what's going to be involved in realizing them. They're, whether they're um, the budgetary impacts, you know, the whole why it's being built, or the physical impacts of the construction sequencing and what that's going to do to your neighborhood. Um, and then ultimately, what, what is the project going to give the community back? And so, so this is new. It's a different way of approaching things, but we had a lot of success with it on the Bay Bridge when we were literally, I mean, you don't, you don't get pushback from the client when the client can't work. The client comes to you and says, how do we get going again? And then if you're a communication professional, then, then I say you've got to connect with the audience and stop it. Okay, we, have to, we have to let them understand what it is we're trying to do. And that's where these visualizations have started to enter the, the role of, of storytelling, just like entertainment is. And, and I think one of the things you're going to touch on is, is the tools are the same, which is kind of interesting. That both sides are using very similar tools. Right. I mean, all of our processes grew out of special effects, right? 3D Studio Max was really a media and entertainment tool. Uh, the gaming uh, technologies I've talked about really they made it possible to do real-time models now cost-effectively on these projects. We don't get the budgets that the Hollywood folks do, although they claim they don't get budgets either, but you know, it's still a factor of 10 larger than ours. So, yeah, I, I think the tools and processes are just the same. When did you guys, uh, a couple questions, when did you guys kind of adopt this, this uh, methodology that this showed versus the old way you were doing it? I think, I think it's always been there a little bit, and the reason yeah. I say that is because, well, for us in particular, we have an art institute in Denver, mm -hmm. and they have an animation program, and they do spaceships, they do little dancing characters. That's where we've hired uh, probably 80% of our staff, and because there's no special effects industry in Denver, so they couldn't get a job in Denver doing that. Um, I think they had to be people who are interested in the real world, you have to want to understand a curb and pavement and what color is concrete and, and kind of be interested in that. But we have found the most success with people who started in the creative side and wanted to learn the technical side. I honestly believe it's much harder to go the other way. I think there's a whole other industry now with you know design and construction support where maybe going the other way is more valuable, where you're a technical person who learns to be creative. Um, it, it can be done, obviously. But we're, we're following the, process, the same kind of process, maybe not as well as we, we could or should, but, uh, um, but pre the pre the animatic, you know, we just call it a pre viz um, and you, you were talking about doing that to get sign off, so you weren't spending a lot of money to sign on, on putting more asset, flushing out or whatever. Uh, but you had a certain amount of investment getting to that point. So um, you had an original script develop those shots first. You, you, you didn't come up with that concept in, you know, in, in the dark, right? You, Sometimes you didn't have a script, but yeah. yeah. I, I think we always... We had a storyboard yeah. to begin with. Yes. It's Usually we make it ourselves or we get it from, uh, from the client, but 
typically what we get from clients are just, I kind of want it to be this, or I want to emphasize that. An idea. And we have to then take that and make it visual. Yeah, what I was trying to figure out was, we use previs to get sign off on final, before we go to final render, um, and figure out what else we maybe need to flush out. But uh, um, I was trying to just figure out how much of that you're actually still building the story uh, versus just getting the sign off. What's pre previs? Pre previs. Um, it, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that <coughs> getting sign off, you know, we've all struggled with writing a scope for an animation. I mean, it's the hardest kind of scope you can write. We're going to do four minutes of animation. <coughs> what does that mean? Are we going to dissolve a bunch of images together, or are we going to build a million polygon model and go through it? So I think doing sketches or something to give them an idea of the scope of the model is one aspect of, of the, you know, the the business side of doing storyboards. The other is to get a, an idea of, is this the image of the project that you see as well? It does serve that previs purpose, I think, as well. Yeah, that can be done with stills. You know, you could probably build a whole storyboard out of just still renderings instead of doing animatics, which are a little more work. But um, again, for us then, the animatic shows us exactly which part of the models we're going to see. So it provides a, a kind of a driving flush for us. Have you had trouble selling the, uh, you know, that kind of creative uh, enhancement? Because we've actually done some very nice cinematic tech stuff and had pushback occasionally because like, no, oh, no, you know, it's too, you know, too Hollywoodish or whatever. And, and uh, um, you know, they, we don't want our, our stakeholders to think that we're spending a whole bunch of extra money, you know, uh, doing all this fancy stuff. Well, and there's, there's I added to that, there's the, have you gone, have you put too much thought in it? The stakeholders expect to influence what you're, what you're showing. If you show a rendering that looks completely done, it creates this feeling for the stakeholder, like, I didn't get to say how that tree would go in there, or, you know, if, if it's too polished, sometimes it can have that perverse effect, too. But I think also having success with it, and Bart's going to talk about that a little bit more, how the communications program being successful, that's the metric we're all looking for. Yeah, you have to do this. Look, it worked. I mean, and it actually had real impacts. It, it, we get that pushback a lot. And honestly, we do a lot of projects where we never get that. We yeah. just can't get somebody to buy into it, and we do it the same old way you've been doing yeah, it for years. Yeah, and a good example is like, who is your audience? You know, meaning, like for us, when we're pursuing a project, it's important about, OK, who is on the selection committee, and are they the type that wants the Hollywood list, or are they the more practical, old school? You know, so you have to kind of know about that. And I think all the part of the whole uh, storyboarding I show is that they keep thinking, oh, you gotta model everything, you know, build the entire tree to show one one portion. You know, and sometimes we don't have the budget to do that. And the story you know, storyboard will just sort of say, what do we need to model that would be the most effective, you know, biggest impact, you know, to you know, kind of tell the story. Well, see, you know, this is on the front end, you're gonna win the job, but but you know, from a VDC perspective, there's also visualization storytelling that the public doesn't see. And on that project in particular that you showed, there was, you know, the way the people that are on the site the project explained to me is, you know, it's called Firmex designed it, and the paper plan that I just did, you know, two by three foot. And I was told Caltrans put a clause to the contract with the contractor out there was required to reverse engineer the paper plans and put it into this full blown 3D model. With all the rebar and all the post tensioning ducts and everything to find all the errors and omissions, which they did. So the contractor basically was telling the story. He the model back to Caltrans. Caltrans gave it back to FirmX. Said, okay, either fix it or hire a lawyer. So what FirmX did is uh, they hired uh, the guy that worked for the contractor to model it. To fix it, so it's. But that was a storytelling. It was. It was. You know, the contractor put it together. There was no. There was no way to tell that story with text. You had to tell that story with with, you know, the, the model of how it was going to be built. Yeah, I, I think visualization is still fifty percent. I mean, excuse me, VDC, BIM, whatever you want to call it, is still fifty percent visualization. Somebody had a slide yesterday that was beautiful is useful. I thought that was a great quote. Because if something looks good, people engage with it, and they watch what you're showing. So I think even a 4D model can be done well, and it can be done poorly. And you know, 
visualization is the key to that. Right. Well, Telling in this, in this case, it wasn't so much looks good as fits good. Right. right. Well, what's further on? Should I do the map a little thing? Yeah, um, well, we're going to show you, uh, we're actually going to do the full, is it a minute? I think it is. It's the full minute public service announcement that, uh, that we did, and I'll set it up before you, before you run it. So we had, um, Jesse, it's great to see you. Why don't we start with you? You're actually here. We had, uh, we, had start, we had this project called the West Approach in San Francisco for the bridge that was uh, a real monster. Um, it was seven on and off ramps right through the south of market area, a very dense part of the city, where the whole thing had to be, and the main line, the eastbound and westbound, had to be completely demolished and rebuilt within the same footprint without taking the 280,000 vehicles that go across it every day out of commission. So it was this sequencing thing. And, um, and we were going to have to do one of those things that, that, that you really don't like to do on main line alignments, and that's, that was take the main line off onto a ramp and bring it back on. And, and that, it was a particularly confusing area that new drivers, when they would come into this part of coming off the Bay Bridge and coming into San Francisco, traffic would slow down because there's all this decision making that has to happen. So this was sort of the first time that we said, okay, this is a perfect example of, of needing to use an animation to explain what the action is going to be uh, during this period. And this is, uh, this is 2004, 2005, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, right, right around that time. So that so, so although you're awesome, Jesse, I think we're looking like PlayStation type of uh, type of graphics back back then. But it really worked. The the animation really showed what was what we were expecting to happen, and it worked for stakeholders because we had to get approval. We literally had to go to the governor to get him to agree to allow us to close the Bay Bridge. And these types of visuals uh, center everybody and let everybody understand kind of what the big goal is. And then we took it and we put it out mainstream into public service announcements that we showed on television and key spots and, and ultimately in movie theaters as well because we had to get a very big audience. So that, that, that grew into something bigger as we actually had to close the whole bridge later for the, for the Eastern Span job because some very massive construction operations were going to be taking place out there. And in this case in, uh, in 2009, what, uh, what we wanted to do is, is Parsons was doing the animations at, at this point for that particular part of the job. Uh, we wanted to, we actually wanted them to be slicker. We wanted them to be more photorealistic. We wanted people to believe that this could be done. Not like we're, we're hoping this could work. We wanted it to really look um, Hollywood effects-ish. So we brought on, um, we brought on Craig Barron and Matt Wilder. Craig actually works at different studios now. And they worked together. I think you, your guys actually went over to Bad World a couple of times, right? And you know they got to look at the Oscar and all that type of stuff. But um, but it was one of those times when when both of our industries came together to, to do something. And um, and and Craig was awesome. He he gave us a lot of value for for what we asked for him because literally the animation had been done before. We used it to bring media on board and and, and to get all of the stakeholders, elected officials, and those types of people to say, okay, tear the bridge apart and rebuild it in four days. Um, but this time we needed the next level. So we brought them in to do an establishment shot and, and uh, the moving piece of the bridge. And, um, and then what we also did, um, and this reaches into another industry, is we used videography. Because we're storytelling now. So we're going to use every type of piece that we can get our hands on so that people will Know, not only understand that we're serious, this bridge is going to be closed, we're going to do this, but they'll believe we can. Because when you're going to do something that's that far out, and with our infrastructure here in America right now, we need to do many far out things, getting people to believe you can is critical to being able to move forward. So that's the setup for the shot. This is the public service announcement. Nah, let's leave the audio off. This already happened. So. We were building on what we had done before. In 2007, we had closed the bridge for this massive operation. So it's not time to show the animation anymore. Let's show the time-lapse photography. And then let's show crews out there getting it done. You know, what, what are the glory shots that we could show of construction being effectively done? And then throw in our partners from the CHP. Now, these are the shots that Matt World did. Establishment, and this is the basic operation. 
we needed it simple. Something moves out, something moves in, on goes the track. And this was very complex, and PB's animations were extremely complex. But what we needed to do with this piece is get everybody bought in. This is how it's gonna go, it's not gonna go that fast. And then ultimately, why are we doing this? So you can get that. And they threw in that shot for free. <laughs> and uh, we used that heck out of that shot, the whole uh, daylight into night, and the, the glory shot of the bridge and traffic running across it. Uh, because, because it was storytelling, again, it was saying, one day you're gonna be driving across this thing. And another message that we had on that particular project is that, that this bridge is not just a workhorse, it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be an icon, it's gonna change the way that, that Bay is gonna look. And so though that is a lot of storytelling to try and wind even into a full minute piece. And so by doing effective uh, visual communication, you can do that. Plus they were using the words like rebirth and the dawn. It was interesting to hear how they talked about creating these things. Yeah, it's funny when we do get together with them, they always tell us we're, you know, we're not storytellers. <laughs> All right, so that, that was sort of um, bridging the gap, is kind of what we called that just because it was the one time where, where we literally worked together for them for a purpose. And, and all of this, of course, is, is for a reason. There's got to be some, some gain that the project is, is getting. So um, here's my boring text slide, um, where audience is, is the key. I think everybody, everybody knows that. In the entertainment industry, you know, their, their goals are basically, they're basically to be a slave to the story. You know, occasionally, you can come up with a plot point because you can make something look better, but not too often. What you're supposed to do is, is work towards moving the story together and not be perceived if you're a special effect. And the, the, greatest, um, the greatest honor that can be paid to an effects house is when you leave the movie, say, I didn't even realize there were any special effects in that movie. Not, not, uh, doesn't happen too much in today's movies. But, uh, but, but that's what they're looking for. They wanna be, they, they wanna be anonymous. They wanna make you believe that they pull off some kind of trick that's actually there. Where, for us, it's on the engineering side, the project delivery side, it's, it's completely the opposite. We want to show you the real world the way that it's going to be when our magnificent project is done. You know, and we want to tell you that this is a simulation. Or we want to put in front of your face uh, a variety of simulations that you can choose from or augment. We're very upfront about the fact that we are changing what the actual reality is, and so that there is this return. And that is one of the areas where we don't speak the same language. And it's been interesting having the conversations back and forth. Um, I, I actually thought some of the resistance for us working together would be just simply, are we gonna be competing for work? You know, one day, are our, our engineers going to be basically doing special effects for movies because we own these complex models. If you have modeled a whole city, and if you model San Francisco and they're gonna remake Bullet and Steve McQueen's gonna go drive in those streets today, well then why wouldn't they use your model instead of recreate a whole model for, for their purposes? That's just a question. We'll only model the things we can actually build. You know, look like at Avatar, you know, you see Avatar, look at these cool flying things, you know, the thing that looks like a big fat tick and the butterfly, it's a, but the engineer looks at it and goes, yeah, there's no way a fan of that size can produce enough thrust and a gas of that density to get it off the ground, right? That's 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 this difference of thing. One one person's number mesmerizing, the other person is analyzing the physics of uh, the animation and saying that would work. Yeah, but ah, but see, the interesting thing is not everything is science fiction. You know, some other other movies, like when they're done really well, you can't tell just how much visualization has actually played a role in, in what's going on there. In, in the, like, I like to use Bullet for some reason now. Maybe it's because we have a San Francisco model. But, um, <laughs> but that, it, pretty much everybody knows that's, that scene in that movie where Steve McQueen's in the green Mustang, 67 Mustang, blowing through the city and doing all these jumps. If you, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube, Bullet, Steve McQueen. Um, and, and what's fun to, to, to do with that movie now is to look at the way the city used to look. You know, it's like, it's like when an episode of Streets of San Francisco comes on. 
you know, or, or any old television show centered in a city where the city has, has moved on. Uh, so in that case, if you're going to make Bullet and McQueen's going to do that drive, drive again, or maybe it will be McQueen because they're like re, rebirthing dead actors. But I don't know. But you're going to redo that. Then you're going to want the city to look the way that it does now. And if you can't get the permits to, to close all those roads, but you probably could in San Francisco, um, then you'd be potentially be going to a mall. But this is all theoretical. Like Gangs of New York. Ah. Yeah. Or the, uh, what's the one with Tom Cruise? He's standing on Fifth Avenue and there's nothing as far as you can see. And apparently they did shoot it on a day when there was no traffic, but they had to paint out traffic. Mm -hmm. Vanilla Ice? No. Yeah. Oh. Vanilla Scott. Vanilla Scott. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Vanilla Scott. Close right there. <laughs> oh, there's a name I didn't think would come into this. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was that was the point in, in talking about these um, these two different audiences, and, it, and it's a major difference in what we're doing. But yeah, we're still using the, the same tools in building worlds. But was there? A, yeah. So yeah. this this slide, the two bullet points you have right there. Essentially, are, they identify the hurdles of what it is that we're doing. And you started off the presentation with the piece where it is we're essentially being distracted by the details. And we're forgetting about the communication and the emotional contact, right? So you have to remember that we be creating these pieces for the communication and then the ultimate emotional contact so that everybody leaves the table smiling. Not necessarily a physical table, but a situation, smiling, everybody's happy, uh, ish. All right. So this is where it is. We get distracted by these details. We get overly focused on the data, and we think that the data is the ultimate goal of what it is we're up to. And that's really not what we're up to. But we think it is because of our backgrounds and our situation and our environment, essentially being in the design, the AEC the design world. Right. <clears throat> so we focus on that. And we, uh, we totally forget about the communication aspect, the smile aspect, the emotional contact, and you know the personal interaction that we get to, of which is entertainment. And so not only do we have an internal struggle, we have an external struggle. How the hell do you manage those three things, times two? You know what's interesting about what you said? It's like taking this these two bullets and one-upping them. You know, you could you could basically say what I was gonna say. Uh, it, it, is that it's all about knowing your audience, but really it's not. I mean, that's the first step. But what it's really about is knowing your story. Like, what what really is the impact that you want out of what you're doing? Is it to be happy? If it's in the entertainment industry and you're doing a horror film, it's just scare the crap out of someone. It's a different emotion that you're that you're looking for. Over on our side. What are we trying to get out of the story that, that we're telling? Are we trying to convince someone that, yes, this can be built? Or are we trying to tell them that, that don't worry about the impacts of what's going to happen this weekend because there's going to be options for you? you know, or are we trying to influence them to pick a certain option? We wouldn't do that. <laughs> Just present everything fairly. But you know what I'm saying. It, it's, it's going off, it's, taking, it's going beyond just know your audience, which you should take for granted. You've got to know who you're talking to. And going into know your story. Like what elements are you going to create visually that are going to be a slave to that story and ultimately give you the goal that you're looking for? And there's a great story we always tell when we, <clears throat> we hire new people. People usually start in our group as painters, you know, working in Photoshop, cleaning up images, that sort of thing. And I, I walked up to somebody and he was zoomed in at like 600%. And he was uh, painting these little pixels out and, it, and taking hours to do it. And I, I just said, what are you doing? And zoomed back out to 100%. You couldn't see what he was doing in the image. It's sort of a, a, a smaller idea of, you know, you can't get focused on the details. It's so true. You have to stay at the full screen view. What is the impact of the image that people are seeing? Again, I think that's a very Hollywood sort of approach, is what are they seeing on the screen? Not do they see the blue car, you know, eight blocks down the street. Sort of build a set, build a scene, and, and focus on what's being conveyed by that scene. That, that's, that's right, and while, while, while that's absolutely correct, at the same time, 
we study things at different scales in the design world, in the AC design world, um, but we forget about why it is we start out a set of documents with an overall location plan. Then we go into a site plan. Then we go into a floor plan. Then we go into sections. We do know this, but we forget because we automatically zoom into what what is the, the real um, liability in these situations. So we focus on what the liability is overwhelmingly, whereas when we're doing this visual communication thing, we have people already covering the liability. We need to focus on the communication aspect of it, but in the group and the situations that we're in, we're focused on the liability aspect, which is the finite details. Right? We mess up the calculation on how many pieces of rebar we're putting in a piece of concrete. Oh, no, you it's not the You gotta put for purpose. information only on the bottom. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Solves everything. <laughs> Continue. Okay, so end goals. Well, I, I think we kind of we kind of went to that a little bit. In the entertainment industry, it's 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 connecting to emotions, so that you can so that you can have the big box office success, and then ultimately make another one. Um, and and although more business is, is a is part of what everybody does, you want to stay in business and keep doing that. Um, on, on our side, what these visualizations are doing, at least from the way that I see them in, in communications and actually getting projects built, um, are supporting. The budget. Oh, it's going to cost a lot to do this, uh, this simulation, this visualization. How much is it going to cost not to do it? Okay, what type of problems are we going to experience because people don't get it or don't believe in it? And then there's then there's schedule, and that gets into the whole 4D modeling aspect of, of storytelling and and identifying conflicts from a programmatic standpoint uh, so that you can resolve them before they actually happen. Again, you're saving time, you're saving money. Those two kind of work hand in hand. But, but probably the biggest one that, that I can say as a, a communicator, and it should kind of end all discussion because you can't put a monetary value on it, is public safety. When you're dealing with infrastructure projects, like many of us are, public safety is, is critical. How are you going to get through the process of realizing your job and allow the public to do whatever it is they have to do in the regions that you're working? Are you going to be interrupting water flows? Well, how long can you do that? What's that going to do to that particular community? Are you going to restrict the ability for traffic to move into a certain area? How does that affect health services? How does it affect the industries? Now, these are things that, that you have to look into and kind of figure out. But you will always, the project teams figure them out. And then the real trick is communicating to those constituencies and getting them to understand, OK, this is what I have to do. Up in the Bay Area, BART went on strike. I don't know if you guys heard about that. I ride BART every day, so it, it, it impacted me. But how are we going to get people who are just get on the train, go to work, get back on the train, how are we going to interrupt their day so that they know that these are their options that they're going to take so that they can see that government still does work for them when actually it's not working for them and they don't vote everybody out? You know, it depends on what your perspective is, on what the return on investment potentially will be. So this is where we had a couple of case studies. And, um, and what I like this, we're kind of going back and forth, so just interject as we, as we talk. Um, we, uh, we can start with what we did with Google Earth back in, in 2008. And uh, this was an interesting visualization study because Google Earth was really starting to come into its own and add a 3D layer. And they had 400 million users at that point. I don't even know what it, what it is right now. We can see it down from that. Do you guys still use Google Earth these days? But at that time, it was hot. And what we were struggling with it, on the Bay Bridge, now it could just be a case study, because that bridge is over. Um, and I don't work on it anymore, so I can talk about these things. Um, we were struggling with the fact that we were potentially going to change the design tag. We were going to go away from something that we had marketed and put out there and was voted on. And we were going to try to do something a little bit more simpler. Or were we going to go back and do this? And we had just come through that and said, no, we're going to build this. But everybody was confused. And, and that confusion made people think, this project's never going to end. It's a bottomless pit. And, um, and there was no confidence. So we came up with this idea of, of putting our model of the bridge. And this is the key component of it. 
because as you look at Google Earth and you think of Google Earth, probably all of you right now know that, that the image quality isn't the best. You know, and if you want something to look kind of real, you're not going to Google Earth with a schedule model. You know, you're going to do something else. But what Google Earth had was the was the public audience. They had the delivery mechanism. It could link 400 million people could go into Google Earth, zoom into your area, and take a look at what was there. So that from as a communicator, that's why I wanted Google Earth. I wanted to be able to be there where people could stumble upon us and add this legitimacy to us one day realizing the bridge. And so we go to Google, and, and uh, I had run into Michael Jones at a couple of speaking things. So he put me in touch with their people that, that decide these things. And, uh, and, and they basically said, well, it's an amazing idea to kind of do this. And, and, and we like, we love the bridge, but no, we're not putting the Bay Bridge in Google Earth. That would be lying to our constituency. And we don't do that. We, we don't do evil at Google. And so we said, OK, well, but could we come down here and come down to, uh, what are they, Mountain View? We come down to Mountain View and just tell you what we had in mind. And that was what was kind of cool about Google is they were out for that. We said, yeah, come on down. So we went down there and we showed this, them this, we showed them this convention that, that came from the gaming industry, really. I think there was even a presentation here on gamification um, where we had modeled the bridge such that we could show them the parts of the structure that had already been built as solid and the parts that hadn't been built yet as transparent. And so this transparent model of the bridge was, was placed into Google Earth so people could impute, could intuitively know that what they were looking at wasn't really there. Something was happening. Some action was taking place at that location. It was not a lot, right? It, it's, it was an uncompleted thing. It added, it added the fourth dimension to Google Earth. And, and Google had already believed they had the fourth dimension because they, could, they had a time slider. They were just beginning the time slider at that time. You could go back and see ancient Rome. There were a couple of places you could go see. But they could never take you into the future, and that's what we were giving them. And so they agreed to run this, this pilot program with us. And in 2008, the Bay Bridge became the first uh, construction project to be placed into, into Google Earth. And again, the, the, the primary reason for doing that, communicating to our audience, and this is something that, that we learned, because really being able to touch 400 million people was highly attractive and wanted to. But that never really materialized. We didn't get a rush of traffic to our website because you could click on that image and it took you right there. But what we did get is that legitimacy. Because people could stumble upon to the bridge, or we could give a presentation, like today. We could go, literally bring Google Earth up, and the bridge popped up. And then you could go back to your desk and do it yourself. It added that legitimacy. Yes, this project is going to be done. You know, it doesn't matter what challenge it was facing at what point in time, because there always are always challenges to projects. If they can see it, they can believe it. And so Google is a really powerful part of our communication strategy for that reason. The second thing that Google gave us that others can do better now is the ability to view the project off the rails. You know, we didn't pick the camera pan that shows you exactly what we wanted you to see. You go explore, run around, take a look at your own versions of it. I can tell you kids, artists were doing that and tracing their version of the bridge so that they could make their own t-shirts in the Bay Area. So it became this interesting tool of familiarizing yourself with a structure that wasn't there yet. And it helped a little bit with the logo of a certain NBA team. But that's another story. Well, you know, we just go back to the old analog day, but a plan sheet is just a map of something that's not there yet. What this is, it's you know, a, a design model. It's just a model of something that's not there yet. So it's like we, it's it's the, it's not a new concept. It's just a new medium, right? It is the medium that's important. It's the fact that the plan sheet wasn't sitting in everybody's cabinet that we would, would potentially look at. Because you have the internet now, now people can go and actually find this stuff. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this, because this is probably too much in my world and not enough on yours. But part of, this, part of the issue in, in this world is like, how do you get out to your audience? For the entertainment industry, it's pretty clear. It, it's it's the, the box office 
the movie theater seat, and then later your couch when they get the DVD sales. Um, but, but for us, it's a, it's a little bit different. Like how, depending on what we're trying to achieve, uh, what are we going to use? It's, it, almost everybody in my industry says social media solves everything. Social media doesn't solve nothing. You know, <laughs> it creates more problems than it solves in a lot of cases. But what it can do better than nothing else is distribute information. But you have to have good information to put out there in the first place. And so what we did here um, was we took an old idea, <coughs> pool footage. You know, media always, when they can't get the camera somewhere, one guy will go shoot it, they'll pull it out so everybody gets the, gets the shot. Well, what we created here, something we, we kind of stole from Steve Jobs a little bit. And instead of the Genius Bar, we created the Media Bar. We created a place where they could, that was centrally located on the web that was for them. We kept it open to the public, but it was a professional site where they could download three to 15 second snippets of content. Now, most of the content was uh, construction videography or still photography, but sometimes it was animation if we were pushing something that we were about to do. And the reason why we created this thing, and we actually brought the media in and talked to them about very technical things like what Kodaks are you guys looking for so we can give you the video and you'll actually get it up there. But the reason why we did this is that the media sucks. They don't get things right, hardly ever, when you're working on a project. I mean, we can be real here, right? Even though this is recording, um, journalism is not what it used to be. And, uh, and it's very rare that you've got the, the the transportation reporter, the infrastructure reporter, the architectural critic that actually studies and understands your job. And so there's misrepresentation everywhere. And the problem with public information officers is that it hurts us more to go back and correct errors many times than to just let them go. So you got one chance to get it right, and it has to happen before the story. So the media bar is a distribution center that allowed people to automatically get the content that they needed so that the story can be accurate. And it, it wasn't a panacea to the problem, but it greatly affected even tone. Because everybody wants to get their job done. Right? Your conference is all over, and you're probably wondering what messages are in your email right now. You know, the media has to get their job done on a daily scale. So if you're, if you're helping them with that, they're going to be receptive to it. And that's what the media was. It was a way of distributing content, and the animation stuff was was part of it. And so then, um, then we have the products that, that we create. So there's a whole other concept of model-based design and, and what, creating a really sophisticated 3D model and then one-offing things and, and repurposing things. And, and that's great in a perfect world. Uh, the world hasn't completely got there yet. But what we had with, uh, with the Bay Bridge was a pretty, pretty significant chunk of, of um, of 3D modeling that we could actually create different materials with. And so we, um, we had one instance where, well, 2009. Let's stay with the Bay Bridge for a second. We had to do this massive thing that we needed people to believe that we could do. We were tearing out one section of the bridge, football field size section, two levels of roadway, and we were pushing this 3,500 ton piece of steel 100 feet out of the way we were pushing a 3,700 ton new piece of steel that was almost exactly like it, 100 feet to connect into the bridge and onto a detour. All of this was 150 feet in the air, and it seemed really maybe not so possible to do in, in three days. So we had all this messaging to do with that. And just the fact that the bridge is gonna be out, you gotta get people to other transportation um, services is enough. Then you go into why and all of that. So although safety and alignment were a big part of the messaging, it got lost in all of that stuff. <coughs> and when we opened that alignment, the media started calling it the S curve because the S in that curve produced a lot of accidents at the very beginning. And although Caltrans had followed the design manuals for what should be out there, in this instance, we needed to go beyond those design manuals. And so we were, we had a couple of jackknife big rigs, and then the ultimate tragedy, we had a big rig go off the bridge, fall 150 feet down, and then the driver die. And so we had a tragedy now, and on this new alignment, and people were criticizing their safety. Now that driver that, that went off the road was driving at 5 a.m. in the morning, uh, going 85 miles per hour into the curve, and uh, had an unsecured load. 
They literally were two lanes away from the edge. And this load of pairs shifted on them and pushed a big rig two lanes over and off the bridge. So operator error was involved, but that's not getting into the media stories, right? New alignment, tragic death. Okay, that's, that's what we were dealing with. And we were getting ready to do another alignment. So one thing we had to do is try and get the messaging out there more about alignment change. But the other thing is that the alignments that we were going to be doing now weren't going to be nearly as complex as that. So we wanted to disrupt that single story of, of fatally tragic alignments that Caltrans is doing on the Bay Bridge. So what we did was we took, we took the model and we dropped it into a, um, a game engine. You want to talk a little bit about the engine? Yeah, so I think I've presented this before, but it's uh, UDK, it's Epic Games, has an engine that um, works very well with 3D Studio Max. So again, we use some basic gaming uh, tools to optimize the model, uh, port it in, and then UDK allowed us to create interaction, run interactivity. If you saw the user there, you can drive using the accelerometer in the iPad. All that functionality was provided by the gaming engine. So, Again, kind of a gamification of a, of a driving simulator, if you will. That's absolutely what this was. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to present the information, the bullet points that, that we were creating for this new alignment in that vernacular. And what I mean by that is, if you're going to have an interactive medium that you're going to be communicating with, you don't want to communicate the same way you would in a video, where you just spit the information at them. You want people to feel it. You want them to interact with it. You want them to learn in a different kind of way. And that's what Bay Bridge Explorer endeavored to, endeavored to do. And we got a great metric back for our return on investment from this. We did this, uh, we did this event where we actually brought in, I didn't want to do it, and we didn't want to have Kevin, anybody that was involved with the bridge, we didn't want them to test this the first time. We went and got traffic reporters to be part of our press conference. These are the trusted faces that the region wakes up to in the morning to tell them where they're going to go or what the problems are. And we brought them in, and Autodesk was a partner, so we had an event at Autodesk. And the traffic reporters actually drove this first in all the media reports so that people could see that, oh, you could go to the uh, iTunes store and download this thing and actually drive this new alignment before it was put in place. So there's no reason for you not to understand what's going to happen here. You're going to have this type of interaction available to you for free if you can go to the, the iTunes store. And in the short amount of time that we had before the opening, we got 10,000 downloads. Now, that's not Angry Birds by any stretch of the imagination. But you don't qualify it that way. The way that you qualify it is public outreach. You know, when, when, when we buy media spots, they're, many times they're in impressions. So you get 100,000 impressions if you go to New York Times, but, you know, that type of thing. A download is much more valuable metric than an impression. What is an impression? A download, somebody spent time to acquire it and try it. You can perceive that they tried it because they actually allocated some memory and spent time and somehow found out about it, which is really what the impression is. And so you have this extra bit of qualifying material for your metric. People have downloaded it. And, um, and then you're getting the feedback because you're using your social media. People are experimenting. It. I think we got nailed on this one because we didn't have guns or oil slick um, on, the, on the vehicles. And maybe not enough. You know, there were no coins that you could get like the Mario Kart or that type of thing. Wow, well, Caltrans made us do it at the speed of 50 miles. Could you that you could get Hagar to drive it? Oh, that would be that was, we gotta get, we gotta call somebody and get him involved in one of these. I can drive the <laughs> So anyway, that was, that was a, another example of, of a medium where we were able to take visualization and, and create a really compelling communication model, and it gave us a fantastic thing to talk to, well, it solved the client's problem. You know, it, it wasn't about us rationalizing our existence. We had a big problem that we needed some way to solve it, and this did that. Is vision the last thing you've got? So then we'll leave you with the with the one the one thing that did, that didn't get realized. And uh, and you want to run it, and I'll talk about it. Sure. That way, if it fails, if you you messed it up. So with with the Bay Bridge, and um, it recently opened, and it, it didn't have the the grand opening that uh, that had always been envisioned when the president came down and torched the chain and all of that. I think Gavin Newsom come down, but. Um, 
one of the biggest communications points for this project that was important to all of the owners. In this case, it went from Caltrans to also the Bay Area Toll Authority, you know, the regional traffic group up there, um, and uh, the California Transportation Commission. They were sharing ownership of this, this project now. And one of their, their big, um, big communications points is that this was going to be an icon. There is going to be architectural merit to this. We're going to build a signature bridge, one that will become a draw to this region. So seismic safety was the first reason why everything was done, but iconography was, and architecture was really a, a big, big part of this job, and why so much visualization was, was done. Um, so having this bridge actually kind of ranked by architectural critics is going to be an important part of its opening. Although when we were forecasting where we would be with a bridge with our 40 models, it wasn't going to look too pretty because we had a mandate for a seismic safety opening. That means that not all parts of the bridge were going to be completed, but it would be safe enough for people to drive on. We needed people off this dangerous other bridge. But it wouldn't have the beauty that was such a key part of that. So we, we decided to create this product, which is, which is not fully done, but this is called Bay Bridge Vision. And the idea was that we could uh, first take architectural critics, reporters, people that were going to be talking about, you know, is the bridge an icon or is it not, is it what, what does it really mean from, from an aesthetic point of view, we could actually take them out onto the job and let them see cases where things that weren't actually complete, like there would have been scaffolding potentially on some parts of the bridge, especially the parts that were below, or areas that haven't been painted all the way, or in, in one thing, can you look the other way? Yeah, right. If you go, go look at the island, because that was all done. We can tell you what the real problem was. The problem was the island. The bridge wasn't going to be, the bike path wasn't going to be finished. It was one of the biggest questions. Hey, the bikes can only go this far. We can't get to the island. Well, so what this, what Vision was going to do was show them this is how the connection is going to be. Again, it's trying to let people understand you will get this eventually. Here's what it is. And then as you, as you take your, as you wind your route down to the island and, and figure out how that happens, there are architectural elements of the bridge that that we embellished here in the visualization that don't exist on the, on the project right now. There are a couple of bridgeheads kind of a little bit further back there, and you can point out if you get close, that aren't built yet, but they're done for architectural reasons to make the, to communicate a little bit with the 1930s Art Deco design that begins to happen at the tunnel and as you go through to the other side. Uh, but they wouldn't be there at all, and when they're not there, the, the bridge actually didn't connect perfectly in. There's this ugly, um, button that sort of stuck out from the side of it. So we wanted to be able to address those things that we could potentially be criticized for. So we had worked with Autodesk on this, and the ultimate product that we were making was going to be geolocated so that you could physically kind of be in the same space. And it even had the ability to, um, to go transparent in some areas so you could see through the bridge at some of the key elements that had been innovated, the seismic features for the, for the structure. And again, this was all about getting people to explore the project at a different time. This is only, this is at the end. Maybe you think at the end you don't need to explore it as much, but sometimes that's exactly when we do. It's when you're explaining just what is this asset that you have. Yes? On this one, I, I do you think a good engineering grade visualization could have been used to mitigate some of the yellow journalism that the Sacramento Bee was putting out about the construction. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, David. That's, uh, <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah, now we've got it. That may be a loaded question. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a question I've thought a lot about because I left the project right when that happened. So I, I was no longer, I was the person that was responsible for dealing with those things up until that point. And I was off the project when that particular thing happened. And although, Although there were renderings done of what was happening at E2, right? you guys worked on that. On the I mean, during all this, we were still doing all the same old traditional looking more color. Yeah. yeah, but I want to get right to the yellow journalism thing because <laughs> because what had happened there is that there there were 32 bolts that broke on the bridge. This is a good case study. The one before that was the drill shaft. Was the what? The, before that was the one with the drill shafts. You know, the the, the slurry and the drill shafts. 
the slurry and the drill shafts. Well, actually, the foundation of the previous contract. So that, that oh, was that, Jesus, that was completely a lie. Um, right? so, sometimes I dismiss that one. But yes, so that was one particular, and what that was, this is a different conversation now. We're going to wait for a minute. Well, we, you stick to the bolts, because I, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't personally, I wasn't personally involved with it, but I, I know the guy who knew this. Yeah. Well, I was very personally involved. And, and what happened there? Let's go this way. There was, there was a paper that wanted to attack another mega project with this mega project. That's what was really happening. And, and there were other people in the reporter involved. And so what they wanted to do is set up a series of stories that showed that there was maybe some government incompetence. And if they could handle, if the government couldn't handle this job, how could they handle another one? If you guys can throw it down. Um, it's the train. So, so you're in a situation where the media is going to be doing this little thing. Like it's, it's not really Hearst, and like you know, you give me the you give me the pictures, I'll give you the war kind of thing. But it's not exactly accurate what they were doing. So the story situation is one of those things where the reporter would actually write something that that I deem a mad lib. They write the story beforehand, leave, leave certain parts of it out, and let you try and construct what the story would be. So that began this whole yellow period. And, and although there was what the, what the bottom line to that was there was one extra test that the contractor had run that was not part of the program, the accepted program for qualifying those piles. And that accepted test was run outside of parameters for those types of tests, <coughs> and it showed a potential void. But tests that were done according to the parameters showed that there was no void there. But just the thought that there was this test that nobody knew about. Like the contractor was worried about this pile. The conspiracy theory. Yeah, the contractor's worried about this pile, so they're like, hey, Jerry, go out and run an extra test before the Caltrans guy gets here. Let's see how close we are. All right, well, we're kind of not close. We'll just hope that this, this goes well. They don't need to show us that test. We come and run our own test. Our test shows that the pile actually cured fine. And off we go. The reporter finds the test and says, hey, they never, they found a void and, and they didn't report it. Well, yeah, they didn't because right after that, the Caltrans guy came in and ran the same test after the, the pile had had the time to cure that was supposed to happen. And that, that's, that's just a kind of glazing over of that, but that's what that was. And it was done because there was a campaign that was being created. The campaign had gone on into um, yeah, a story being told. Yep. There's a story being, story being told for different reasons. So we'll link this back to visualization. So, so then you get to the point where, where something real does, something real always happens out of these projects. And, and there were 32 bolts that, that cracked at one location on the bridge. Rods. They are rods. Now there's part of the problem right there. They, they weren't identified as what they were. They're identified as bolts because people can understand what a bolt is, or they might not understand what a rod is. And so when the when these rods broke and there was all, they were always called called bolts, the um, Caltrans that three agency committee they didn't have an immediate answer as to what was going on there and they, they chose not to speak, they chose not to address what their processes were. They went back, they tried to figure out exactly what they were going to do, and media cycle after media cycle happened without a complete understanding of what these things were. And the reporters went on to, to ask people, and you probably have experienced this, ask people completely unfamiliar with the project. What would happen if this happened on your project? <clears throat> well, they don't have any idea of what's going on in that particular location to really be able to speak to this thing. But I'll make it relevant to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's a little bit too personal to me, so I go. <laughs> but, but had the communications program continued that, that was there before, then we would have went through a process of actually identifying exactly where these bolts are immediately. Like you got to get there within the time frame so that they can do their job, so they don't create something else. And you can tell them exactly. You can go back to the animation that we have on on, on earthquakes and how the bridge is supposed to perform, and you can give them the criteria. Okay, these two thir these thirty two rods are bad. That will affect the performance in this way. Qualify it immediately so that there's no question. That wasn't done. So the extrapolation was that the bridge is not capable of handling traffic. The thing like you're telling me is in storytelling, silence implies guilt. Absolutely. In, in the media, when you, when you keep going iteration after iteration, 
The media cycle is about 24 hours. Nine media cycles and before a story comes back. They've already created a story. And engineers are taught to be silent. Lawyers beat on our heads to be silent all the time. So the, that's the point of how, the way it, the engineering profession is taught, or the learning professions, is is completely 180 degrees to the needs of telling stories to generate support. Right, but it's not that simple because in this case, it's good for the engineer to be silent because the engineer doesn't have enough information to give the full story. And it's just I know there are exceptions, but the typical engineers they want to to sort of tell the whole story and what the possibilities are and people have already nodded off or changed the channel before they've actually qualified the reality of how this is going to affect. What you need is, is, is an administrator or a communicator that comes in and just tells you where you are right now and what the process is moving forward and, and then follows up and keeps on it so that you can really see that there's, you have to give them a feeling of transparency like that, that this is going on and this is now we're into communications 101 for emergencies. But how it all comes back to visualization is, um, is when you can show people what the problem is and what your what your thoughts are on what the solution is, there's a there's an understanding that produces a relief that allows you to keep continue forward. The last thing I'll say on this is in 2009 another thing happened. We had, we found a six inch crack in an eyeball uh, on the bridge, and we couldn't open it back up. We had done the largest single construction operation in the history of the state of California. And we weren't going to be able to open up on time because we found this cracked I-bar. So we repaired the I-bar and, and got the bridge open, and, and not that much of a delay, and that was very heroic. But then, a couple months later, in October, the fix failed and fell down into commute traffic and crushed the car. Now, that's a bad VR situation. You have crushed a car with a steel from your fix during the commute. And I, I, I lived in my office for a week. I slept in the office dealing with that particular problem. But did we ever lose faith that we weren't the right engineers to do this job? That, we, that this project was going to move forward? Did we ever get stopped? Did we get investigated other than OSHA? No. And the reason was we dealt with it right then. We, we stayed right there, and we got the whole issue qualified, and we literally put visualizations of what the repairs were going to be as we conducted them in the field. And so the whole point is that you have to you have to get people to understand, and when you're communicating on a project, there's a timeline associated with that. And, um, and thanks for asking those questions. I know it kind of took us on a slightly different path in this discussion, but it also shows the value of visualization during an emergency. So, so there's a different one now that I think y'all know, the PM for Kevin, and that's the high-speed rail. So we've started construction, along comes Elon Musk, <laughs> Tesla, and, and, he, and he proposes the Hyperloop that they'll do this for one-tenth of the money and less environmental impact. I haven't seen any response to that, but maybe you know, because I'm not in California. Yeah, the, uh, Jeff Morales, the authority um, chair, actually responded to that in several media. And he actually called Elon Musk, and, and Elon released a little bit on some of the statements that, that he had made. Um, that, that's an interesting one. I, I actually had a chance to talk to, to Musk about this at lunch one time. And his, his concept for the Hyperloop came from the simple fact that this is California, this is the West, why is the high-speed rail not the fastest in the world? Why are we trying to copy France or Japan or, or any of these other China um, with their technologies? In California, we should have we should be at the forefront of technology. That's what started his whole process of leading going in. back to popular mechanics from 1960 and finding the, the hyperloop concept and, and moving it forward. And the magic too. <laughs> yeah, but I think that is one of the challenges that that we have on high-speed rail. It's, it's communicating to a bunch of different constituencies about what the possibilities are for this for this line. <coughs> and again, it, it goes right back to letting people believe that it actually will get built. Yes? I think you've done a very good job with the Bay Bridge and, and the animation with uh, uh, staging, convincing the public that this is the best option or this is how it's going to work. Uh, uh, it's iconic. It's, but you need to add two things. One at the very beginning, and one at the very end, uh, from an engineer or from a taxpayer, is that you need to have a, a 
little visual, uh, you know, visualization of money flowing out of people's pockets, you know, to this thing to build it. Because you haven't talked about that you convince anyone to spend their money. It's already that the option is chosen that hey, we can't uh, use the Bay Bridge anymore because that you know fell down during the worth in the World Series, and we got to replace. And everyone's in agreement, but can't agree on the option. Right. The other one is you need to age this about 75 years and have all this and say it's going to last another 75 plus years, you know, before we have to replace it again. Oh, I like that. 